think simple is better because uh, we want the contraction to be the priority. My job as a strength and conditioning coach, again, isn't just to like make them learn a fancy movement. It's to ensure that we're improving physical attributes that I've identified this person needs to be stronger in the lunge pattern. I need to make sure I'm actually strengthening that lunge pattern. So simple exercise selection, even if it can feel a little boring and tedious, I know that if I give them a dumbbell rear foot elevated split squat or a barbell reverse lunge versus doing like a, I don't know, step up to a step down with a kettlebell overhead, I know that the simple exercises are going to do what they need to do, which is strengthen that lunge pattern versus just giving them something that looks cool for Instagram. Hey, it's Ben Wise, and this is the fitness movement. The fitness movement is brought to you by Sewer Fitness. Sewer Fitness is my company and my platform to deliver training content to coaches and athletes like you. The site has educational resources on everything from program design and exercise physiology to skill progressions and movement breakdowns. And in terms of programming, we have our online training program, The Protocol, and I also offer one-on-one remote coaching. It's all at one place, swearfitness.com. Today, we have Georgia Smith on the show, and she is the content marketing manager for OPEX Fitness and Crafted Coaching. And those are sister companies, and we kind of get into what exactly being a marketing manager actually means for her in her practical day-to-day, and she has some really good insights and takeaways about that. She's also an individual design coach for Crafted Coaching. She is an OPEX CCP coach, which is actually how she stepped into her role at OPEX. She also co-hosts the Backroom Talk podcast with Carl Hardwick. And before OPEX, she actually coached and managed a CrossFit affiliate. She also was featured in a Morning Chalk Up article titled 14 Women Making Waves in CrossFit. I will link to that article in the show notes. One thing that's going to be obvious as you're listening to this is that Georgia loves fitness and functional training, but her sport is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So for those who have been listening to the show for a while, you know that I was a collegiate wrestler. So the heart of our conversation today is really centered around strength conditioning training for grappling athletes. But before we get into that, I just had some curiosity questions around uh, basically her current responsibilities, uh, including planning content creation for LearnRx, which is an educational platform that was recently launched through OPEX. So Georgia, Carl Hardwick, Sam Smith, all who I had on the show, and a bunch of other coaches as well have video courses on LearnRx. It's really good stuff. OPEX is actually offering listeners of the fitness movement half off their first month in LearnRx with the code LEARN50. I will link to that in the show notes. Also, be sure to go follow Georgia on Instagram at Coach Georgia Smith. Georgia is super easy to talk to. She's knowledgeable, just a true fitness professional, and I know you are going to love what you're about to hear. So without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Georgia Smith. Georgia, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. Thanks for doing this. So one of the things that's going to become really evident to people quickly is that you have a little bit of a different accent than I do. (laughs) Tell us where you're from and uh, how you ended up where you're at now. Absolutely. It's uh, so funny that you noticed that, but um, (laughs) I am from Australia. So Sydney, Australia, I'm actually headed back there the end of this week Uh, on Saturday. We're going for a trip home for six weeks for the first time in over two years, which I'm very excited for uh, because it's been a, it's been a minute with the pandemic and border closures and things like that. Uh, But I grew up in Sydney, uh, spent the first like 20 years of my life there. Bear with me one second, Ben. My AirPods just connected. We were discussing just before how my AirPods will phantom connect to my... That literally just happened as I was talking. So uh, (laughs) rewind a second. Uh, I spent my first 22 years of my life in uh, in Sydney. I did an exchange program to UCLA uh, in my final year of uni or college, as they call it here. And then uh, just decided I wanted to do some travel abroad once I finished my degree. So kind of went home, saved up some money, came back uh, for my year to travel around the US, do some CrossFit at some different 
different CrossFit gyms, work in bars, like all of that stuff. That was the plan. Met my husband like two weeks into it. Oh, <laughs> wow. Supposed- <laughs> yeah. He wasn't my husband at the time, obviously. It was supposed to just be a, a fun and a casual thing, but yeah. uh escalated worked quite- out. It worked out. It was uh it was a gamble, but we got married. Uh and I ended up staying started coaching full time once I kind of got my roots and got settled. And, uh, that that's why I'm in the, in the States. So was living in Michigan with him originally, uh, running a CrossFit gym out there. And I'm now based in Arizona, uh, working under OPEX fitness. Yeah. So, I mean, you are the content marketing manager for OPEX and crafted coaching. Um, so yeah, obviously I, I love that title. I think it's a really cool job. (laughs) I'm probably personally jealous of you. Um, I think it's really cool. Uh, so how did you end up actually working with, with OPEX and kind of that umbrella? Because I would say like craft that kind of falls under that. Yeah, absolutely. So I went through the OPEX coaching certificate program, uh, as a coach, right. I just wanted to do a better job of writing programs for my gym and my clients, get a bundle understanding of nutrition, like all of these things that we teach in CCP. So I went through, came out to Arizona a couple of times for some like live courses and things like that was just so drawn to the mission of the company and the type of education that was being put out. And, you know, James Fitzgerald, who founded OPEX, uh, he challenges uh, the kind of status quo and the norm in fitness. And he really kind of made me think about these things that I'd taken for granted and just accepted as the truth, but that had been sitting like just a little bit wrong with me for a while. And I I love that, right? Like I went through a huge amount of development and growth with my own fitness practices and just the way I live my life, but then also with how I coach my clients uh, and what I really wanted to do as a fitness coach. So went through CCP, ended up, uh, I don't know, luck, hard work. I don't know what it was, but I ended up getting a job with the, uh, with the team out here. So we moved cross country from Detroit to Arizona, to Scottsdale, uh, to come and work with OPEX and my role with the company. I've been here about three and a half years now, and it's just grown and evolved. I get to do what I love to do, which is talking about fitness and creating content around fitness and writing about fitness and just helping take ideas that seem complex and might be a little bit overwhelming and really trying to boil those down and make them simple and understandable for new coaches coming into our system. So whether that's through our podcast, whether it's through, we do a lot of like downloadable free guides. Uh, We have our new LearnRx platform, which is like a subscription-based, kind of like a Netflix for fitness. Uh, So we put in like a new class in there every week. I manage the content that goes inside of that and work with the instructors to get them uh, brushed up and ready to present. So I just get to do what I enjoy, which is uh, talking fitness with other coaches. And then I do also do some remote coaching still. So with Crafted Coaching, which is like... I guess our sister company, Crafted Coaching, are all OPEX educated uh, coaches that were kind of mentored directly underneath James and brought up in the system. So I still do a little bit of that because I'm never going to stop being a coach uh, first and foremost. Yeah, it's good to still be a practitioner. Definitely. Yeah, you, it's there's a lot of people in, in the industry who... I I don't think I've coached people in like 10 years and they're talking about, you know, the way you should and shouldn't do things. And like, that's okay. There's definitely a time to transition from that, like craftsperson in the trenches coach to the master where you are passing along information to others. But I do think you have to put your time in and I'm definitely still a younger coach. So having that connection with the clients on a regular basis is really important for me. I think I see that a lot, even with the people that are, you know, like the top of their company, if they can still work with people in my mind, they, they're grounded a little bit better than some of the the companies that I see that the person's like just in, you know, business development role or something. I think it's good to just keep a touch on that. Even as you get, you know, maybe you're moving up through your career and you're like, okay, I don't want to have this entire client load to be my full-time job, but still keep a a touch on coaching. I feel like is super helpful thing for a lot of people. 
Gosh, absolutely. And like most of what I do now is remote coaching. Uh, so the majority of my clients, I don't get any FaceTime with. And prior to working for OPEX, I was full-time in the gym, on the floor, working with personal training clients or coaching group classes in person. And I loved that. Uh, was definitely ready for something a little bit different though. And so I found that like shifting into this remote coaching world, I still wanted that like contact, that in-person contact with some people. So yeah. I coach kids jujitsu, which gives me like a little bit of that, like communicating in person fix. And then a couple of my clients are uh, actually people that I train with uh, in jujitsu. So I get to like train with them in the weight room and see them in person and do a little bit of like in-person correction and cueing and all of that fun stuff too. Yeah. Cool. I think that's another actually really good point too, about the the remote coaches and having, you know, in-person connections that you can still, you know, have relationships face to face. It's really, I mean, there's obviously an extreme benefit to remote coaching and the fact that you can work with whoever you want. Like there's really like all the barriers are not down, but like to have people that you work with in person is also in, in my mind, it's just like a way to conserve, maybe not even conserve energy, but like, you know, I'm, I think of myself as more of an introvert, but I think that makes me a, maybe a pretty good remote coach. Cause I can kind of do things on my own schedule at my own pace in the quiet most of the time. But then I feel like I have, you know, the ability to be able to go out. And if I can do that and I can still connect with other people, I find a lot of value in that too. Completely. And even if it's just like a spouse or a friend or a family member that you like get to train with on occasion. And again, give them a little bit of that, like in-person coaching. I think there's a lot of value to stay connected for that, for people that are working exclusively online. Yeah. Agreed. So one of the things you mentioned, uh, you are in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and we'll probably just refer to that as BJJ, uh, for people listening. And um, so you were in a grappling sport. You are in a grappling sport. You can currently compete in that. Um, right. and I formerly <laughs> competed in wrestling through college. So, um, one of the topics that we're going to get in today, I don't want to go there yet, but I'm giving people a little teaser is, uh, basically like strength conditioning training in terms of like, you know, not like actually on the mats, but like, you know, supplemental things from a strength conditioning perspective of how we can best train those types of athletes. Um, but before we get there, I have a few more questions around content creation just because, hmm. you know, they're completely selfish and <laughs> I'm just personally super curious about this. So, um, first of all, like, obviously, as you mentioned, like one of your, your big roles is like distilling this information that's complex, complicated down into simple digestible forms for people, um, is there a way or like any sort of system that you have around or at least thinking about how to like boil these complex things into like a digestible format where it's like, Hey, we can put this into a course, for example. Yeah. I think it's always thinking about what is going to be most helpful for the coach working with a client in real life. So we could give them a bunch of like theoretical information and overload the coach with all of the science and all of the knowledge about one specific topic. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to do, right? Uh, if someone needs that depth, for sure, go down that rabbit hole. But I think about like, what that person needs in that moment to become a better coach, to raise their value, to be able to do a better job of writing programs for their client and try and meet them where they're at. So it's very tempting for people in this space, uh, in like the fitness education space to sometimes feel like they're teaching their mentors, right? Like I could think to myself, when I create educational content, I need to be impressing some top coaches in the field. I need to be impressing James Fitzgerald. I need to be impressing all of these people who already have the knowledge. But the people that need the information and that are coming to OPEX to work with us are coaches who aren't there yet, right? They haven't necessarily got years of experience. That said, we do work with a lot of coaches that are kind of five, 10 years under their belt already. Uh, but just remembering who that person is, where they are on their journey and speaking to them, not trying to impress my peers is, uh, I think, the number one piece of advice I'd uh, give to people who are creating content. That's not the answer I was expecting, but that's uh, really good. <laughs> what I were think, you expecting? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, and that's why I asked, but <laughs> um, no, that that's, 
I haven't heard that explained that way, but that's, that's so true. Like people do that all the time where it's like, you know, you think about who might be potentially out there listening to it, but you write it. So in a way that like, it makes you maybe seem smart, for example. And that's sort of the goal rather than understanding being the goal. Like yeah. if you were an educator, I forget, this is a quote from somewhere, but it's like, if you're an educator, the goal is to, for you to like, you know, actually have people learn, <laughs> right? It's not for you to seem smart um, as the person on the, the other end of the camera. It's like the, the goal is for the, the learning to actually take place and for it to stick with the person and for it to be something that they can actually apply. So I think that's one of the mistakes that I made as a more beginner coach. And I probably still do this sometimes is like, you know, I'm so excited about learning this new information that I like word vomit all over someone, or I just like, you know, over talk or like try to, you know, use terms that are not necessary to like explain like simple things. Right. So like, I think, I think that's such a, a good way to put it. It's a barrier too for, for coaches uh, and just for people who love fitness to put out content. They feel overwhelmed. They feel like they have to, as you kind of said, use these big words and be the smartest person in the room in order to put something out and for it to be worthy. But again, they're thinking about impressing their peers. They're trying to impress people that are smarter than them. And that's not typically who we're trying to serve. As coaches, if we're creating content, we're probably trying to serve our current clients or attract new clients. So we should be speaking to them, to their problems and struggles and at a level that they're going to be able to connect with. And then down the line, once they've shown interest and they've kind of reciprocated back, then you can have those deeper conversations and go down, you know, discussion around energy pathways or something like that but right. that doesn't ever need to be what you lead with. Uh, so keeping that in mind would be my biggest piece of advice for not overthinking content creation. Yeah. Okay. So let's say, well, when you're creating content or thinking about creating content, you obviously have the coaches that are you know, presenting that content. Let's just say it's not you because you have also done some of this, but say it's someone other than yourself. Um, you know, and you're working with, let's just say it's, it's a coach who, you know, they're, they are either going to present, present on a particular topic or you're maybe thinking about the curriculum. Do you like think about like, okay, what are potential topics that we could do? And then maybe who fits into those? Or do you maybe go to someone who you're like, okay, we already know that you can probably teach fairly well. Um, what topics do you think would be good for you to have come across? Yeah. So a little bit of both, right? There's definitely okay. like hotter topics that we seek out certain individuals around to teach on because we know that they're going to do well. Right. So um, for example, Sam Smith, he put together a functional bodybuilding course for us. Uh, he has yep. a lot of experience with that and we knew he was going to do an excellent job. And we also knew our audience was going to love that functional bodybuilding class, which is available in LearnRx uh, for anyone that's interested. So we sought him out to, to do that. In some cases, we have instructors who actually don't have like a bunch of background presenting, uh, who don't have a bunch of background teaching, but they're really passionate about a certain niche. Like they absolutely love a topic. It is what they do every single day. And so they are, again, either we're having a conversation, I'm going to them or they're coming to me, but it's more about, okay, I've got this thing that I really love and I'm really passionate about teaching. Now let's figure out like how we can turn you into a great instructor and a great teacher. So for example, Melissa Gitran, she uh, owns an OPEX gym, OPEX Cura, and she is very deep down the path of women's health. And so she's put together a series of classes for us on uh, nutrition, lifestyle supplementation for or prenatal pregnancy and postpartum. Now she hasn't done any like in front of the camera educating or instructing before. So it wasn't like we know Melissa's a superstar instructor, though I knew she was going to be. Uh, we just knew she was really strong on the content. So then it was, how can we nurture Melissa and get her, you know, in front of the camera comfortable to present on this information that she knows so well. So it's a little bit of both. Okay. So I'm imagining if, if you're going to teach someone how to present, well, I guess the first thing is that you probably have to be able to do that yourself and identify some of like the intangibles of what makes a good presenter. Um, I've seen you present cause I've purchased LearnRx and I've watched some of your courses. Um, do you have like, what, what are some of the things that maybe you think about or that you look for, like for yourself or the, the coaches that you're working with in terms of what makes a, a good presenter. And for people listening, maybe this could also be like, 
you know, this could be in front of the camera, but it could also be like in front of a class as you're doing your, your introduction or like, you know, just like awareness in that sense. Yeah. I uh, guess first things first, if you have kids, put them in debating or public speaking <laughs> when they're younger. Cause <laughs> I definitely, learned, yeah, I learned skills from that, that I've been able to carry through with me into my role now. So I'm very grateful for that, but in terms of like what I think about to ensure that I'm delivering information in a good way, the first thing would be just knowing, know your shit, right? Like know what you're talking about and don't try and speak about something that is over your head or that you don't fully understand uh, because it's going to show. Like people can tell when you're being inauthentic and you don't truly understand your subject. So make sure you know it. And then secondarily, be passionate about it, right? You have to love what you're talking about. You have to be lit up and excited about what you're talking about, because if you're not, then that is going to show as well. So that would be kind of the point one and point two. And that connects to what we discussed before, right, Ben? You want to make sure that that person is an expert in their field and that they're, again, lit up to talk about it and really, really enthusiastic, then when it comes to actually presenting and speaking in front of a camera, speaking in front of a room, just picture the person that you want to help uh, with the information and have a conversation with them. So you're not staring at 50 people uh, all looking at you listening. You're not staring at this like intimidating camera. You're just having a conversation with a person and you have information that is valuable for them. You remind them yourself that you are the best person to teach them that information and you know your stuff. So there's a little positive self-talk that's happening along the way. And again, you're not speaking to your mentors. You're not speaking to the person who has 10 plus years more experience than you. You speak to the person that you're trying to help with the information in that moment. Um, And then just don't stress the little, the little, you know, stuff ups. If you misspeak or something like that, just roll right through it. Smile, be authentic, be yourself. I don't think, uh, especially in the world that we're in today, where people are so used to digesting social media content. Yes, there is a time and a place for polish uh, and we're creating educational material. So we do want it to be fairly polished. But in terms of presentation style, people don't want a dry lecture. People don't want to hear from a robot. They want to hear from a human. So people realize that people will misspeak and it's not the end of the world. Just roll right through it, smile and, uh, and keep going. People prefer personality than, uh, than like a perfect presentation. Yeah. That's a really good point. I think the personality does get cut out if you try to rehearse it too many times, maybe. Yeah. Like and they, they could be like, you're super passionate about it, but like if you beat it to death because you're preparing and you know, you are, you know, super concerned about what everybody on their side of the camera might think about you all of a sudden it like goes from like being super authentic because you care about this thing a lot and having a conversation about it to yeah it seems overly polished and it's just not a good like viewing experience for the person anymore exactly you can always tell when someone has scripted and memorized their script because it sounds robotic it's not the same yeah what do you do in that situation Uh, So I'm luckily not the one who has to deal too much with that. Like we have a director who's behind the camera, Emma, who's amazing at like talking people down off that ledge and getting them to communicate like a human. So she kind of steps in at that point uh, when the camera is actually rolling. Uh, So I I can't claim any credit for, uh, for the actual behind the camera coaching that happens. That's fair, but I'm sure, yeah, you're working with those people and it's, it's a lot to get them from like an idea to, you know, finished product, you know, putting those, all those moving pieces together is, it's no small feat for sure. It is not. <laughs> all right. Let's take a hard, right. We're going to, we're going to move over to the grappling side of things. Um, so a few things, again, we talked about our backgrounds. Um, I think again, sort of BJJ athletes, wrestlers are sort of the two main demographics that we're thinking about. Obviously, this could have carry over to other, you know, striking sports and things that are going to have grappling elements in them as well. And certainly, like we were saying before this, like a lot of the people listening to this are just in more general fitness or CrossFit. So it's like, you know, also thinking about this is something that is hopefully transferable beyond grappling sports as well. Like training is training. So set up the conversation, two avatars that we're going to be kind of talking about. The first one is James. He's a 20 year, 21 year old male. He's a junior at a D three college in the States. 
Um, he is wrestling. He's wrestled since he was in elementary school and uh, in college wrestling at seven minute matches. So think about time to be in that way. And then we have Jordan, who is a 16 year old female sophomore in high school. Uh, she's been doing BJJ since she's been 14 and she's a white belt, which is typically like four to five minute matches. Yeah. Full, full disclosure. Uh, I am not an expert in BJJ, so, uh, I will let a lot of that to you. Um, but full disclosure, I'm not an expert in wrestling, so I'll leave a lot of that to you, Ben, but perfect principles, principles right? Regardless yeah, it's of very the complimentary. Point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, let's, let's say we're in the off season for now. So maybe like six months from these or either one of these individuals competing, um, how might you just think about like overall setup for their training, like creating like a skeleton or like a template for the training, like what things might you put in there? Yeah. So before we get to that, I'm going to just like take one step back because Go this is it. what I always do as an OPEX coach. We have to assess, we can't guess what the starting point is for these individuals. So I don't know what their background is with strength and conditioning. Uh, we know Jordan is a white belt, so she's fairly new. Uh, she's got two years, so she's not like brand new, but she's still fairly new in the BJJ world. We don't know anything about her exposure to strength and conditioning. Based on her chronological age, she's 16 years old. It's probably safe to assume she's got a pretty low strength and conditioning training age. James, same thing. I don't know if he's been exposed to the weight room or not. So I'm going to want to know about their training history before I actually end up prescribing what goes in those workouts. We can still have a discussion though, don't worry. Um, but I also uh, want to take them through an assessment and just like get some truth and understanding of what they're capable of. Uh, Cause regardless of the human, regardless of their sport, uh, we could have two 16 year old females, both in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu who have very different training programs. Again, still principally similar, but what goes in there in terms of exercise selection, what is the priority is going to depend on whether that person can have great efficiency in their squat pattern or not, whether they can take their arms safely overhead or not. So there's going to be things that we identify that will make a big difference as to, are we putting a greater emphasis on conditioning? Because this person, I took them through a 10 minute assault bike for Max Cows and they have a score of 47 versus 130. So things like this will depend where we put emphasis in the training program especially in that like off season phase, right? Six months out from training is when we can really think about, all right, let's work on some of the physical characteristics that are weaknesses. As we get closer and closer to competition, training has to like strength and conditioning in the weight room has to take a back seat and we have to let them be able to put their resources, their time resources and their physiological resources towards actually performing and training their sport. But in this off season phase, that's when we can do some more work to say, okay, this person has a really low training age and low capability in aerobic training. We're going to give them two days of aerobic intervals uh, per week and go from a slow, longer, slower progression down to a shorter, faster progression as we see they're building pacing skills and improving there. Or this person is, they're really weak or they have really poor movement patterns. Let's put some great focus on enforcing those things in the gym because we know that training on the mat is going to be just a little less intense. And I don't want to say a lower priority because regardless of where you are in the season, training on the mat is always the top priority for, uh, for your grappling clients. But in that like accumulation off season phase, that is when we get to kind of lay more of a foundation for physical characteristics that are away from uh, what's happening on the mat. Yeah. I think it's really easy for <laughs> strength conditioning coaches to be like, this is my athlete and like grab them and like, want to like do all this stuff with them. And it's like, no, they're like a doing whatever their sport is in this case, they're, they're a grappling athlete first. They got to be on the mats. Like, and that should be the priority and everything in the, the strength conditioning world should just be a way to augment that performance. Um, so I think that was one really important thing. I think the other really important thing that you said there was how, in the off season, the further you are away from competition, the, the more kind of, you can kind of take a hold of the reins and like kind of make their training kind of further away from their sport. So basically like you can address more of the individual weaknesses that they have because 
the demands of the actual sport can be a little bit less of a priority because they're so far away from competing. Exactly. And they're less beat up from it as well. Like for anyone that's been exposed to wrestling, exposed to grappling, jujitsu, like your body goes through it. You're training at like sometimes near maximal resistance and like real tough isometrics. You're picking people up and putting them down in your sport or your skill training session. And it can feel like resistance training sometimes. So uh, especially as intensity gets picked up in that area, it can be really hard to actually make any meaningful gains in the gym because they're so tired from what's happening on the mat. So you have to just be thinking about maintenance, be thinking about keeping them sharp, uh, working on more neural adaptation. But that, again, that uh, in that accumulation phase where, again, the mat training is probably a little bit lighter, you do have an opportunity to get a little bit more volume in of resistance training, get a little bit more volume in of conditioning and uh, be able to make that more of a focus. So I'm sure for almost every type of athlete, you're going to give them a lot of like the fundamental patterns that you need. So like, for example, um, bend, squat, push, pull, some core work, right? Like aerobic work, like those, some of those fundamental layers. Um, is there any way that you would start to deviate from just like, Hey, we're going to give you some of these, um, like on a weekly basis, like touches of this, are there any, like maybe special type strength exercise that you're like, okay, I think this is maybe a really good exercise for this type of person to add in as an athlete categorically, if we don't know them and their background specifically. Yeah. I don't think there's any good, like BJJ exercises or wrestling exercises, if that makes sense. Like, sorry, sorry for that, like answer, but I just, I don't think that we need to think about mimicking the sport or simulating the sport in the weight room. We just have to think about, like you said, First, if they need to, creating great efficiency and motor control in patterns and then being able to build some like muscle endurance, strength endurance and like actual maximal strength. Because we do know that for grapplers, the stronger you are, there is positive correlation with like outcomes in terms of competition. So people that tend to do best at elite levels in competition also tend to be stronger. Their 1RMs are higher. Doesn't mean that that's always the case. It doesn't mean that we know that being stronger in the weight room is going to make you better on the mat. There's always a ton of factors that are going to be at play. But uh, again, there is good research to support that strength is not a weakness on the mat so long as the mat is also the priority and we're not interfering from training. There may be special cases, right? So let's say if I have a BJJ athlete, now uh, shoulder locks. So where you might take someone, I know that the listeners can't see what I'm doing with my arms right now, but essentially like imagine like taking your elbow out at the side of your body and making like a 90 degree angle with your arm. That person may be shoulder locked either with their palm up or their palm down. So in external and internal rotation. So we want our BJJ athletes, number one, to have good functional mobility through that range, because if they have really tight shoulders in internal rotation, they're going to get tapped or submitted really quickly with a Kimura. We also want them to be strong and be able to defend that so that they can take their arm and pull it up from internal to external rotation in case they're defending a submission. So With that in mind, like something I may consider implementing in a BJJ athletes program would be a dumbbell external rotation if I've identified that that is weak uh, for them. So again, it always depends on the person, whether or not they're getting this stuff programmed. But for the most part, like exercise selection is so simple for these folks. They may, I don't want them to think too much in the weight room. And this like might be a little bit controversial because I know that a lot of the times you'll see grapplers and BJJ athletes like doing a bunch of power cleans and power snatches and like kettlebell over the shoulder, staying on a BOSU ball, one finger on your nose type activities. And people think that that's functional for the sport because it's challenging and they're getting all of these like, you know, learning challenges thrown at them that somehow translate to what they're learning on the mat. But I think that the more we can keep them fresh, uh, including mentally, right? Like, cause they're doing a lot of learning when they go, step on the mat. And we discussed these two avatars, our 21 year old and our 16 year old, 
they're both fairly new or younger in their sports. They've still got a lot of learning and skill development that has to happen. We only have so much capacity for learning. And at some point, uh, we're going to be overloaded and we're not going to be able to take in any more information and process that. So if I can keep exercise selection a little simpler in the gym where we're doing a goblet squat or a front squat or a back squat, or we're performing a dumbbell bench press or a close grip bench press, a deadlift, a trap bar deadlift, a pull up, a weighted pull up, a supinated pull up, some kind of bent row, like all like bread and butter strength and conditioning exercises. And then maybe if they have years of training experience and they've developed the strength they need as a base, and I know that they're capable and ready for it, or they already have the skill developed, then maybe we're doing some clean pulls or some power cleans or something like that at the right time for the right person. Uh, but I don't want them to be mentally too challenged by the exercises that they're doing in the gym because they're already getting that challenge on the mat. So I think simple is better. Simple is also better because uh, we want the contraction to be the priority. My job as a strength and conditioning coach, again, isn't just to like make them learn a fancy movement. It's to ensure that we're improving physical attributes, that we're improving physical capabilities, that I've identified this person needs to be stronger in the lunge pattern. I need to make sure I'm actually strengthening that lunge pattern. So simple exercise selection, even, it can, even if it can feel a little bore, bore, boring and tedious, I know that if I give them a dumbbell rear foot elevated split squat or a barbell reverse lunge versus doing like a, I don't know, step up to a step down with a kettlebell overhead, I know that the simple exercises are going to do what they need to do, which is strengthen that lunge pattern versus just giving them something that looks cool for Instagram. Yeah. You can give them a little bit more general exercises because you're looking for general results for the most yeah. part, like allow the specificity of the training to be the uh, to drive the adaptation for that. And then like, again, sort of like just use that as supporting work for all the weight room stuff, which what basically what you're saying is like, just allow the training to be a little bit simpler where it's like, you don't have to spend all this time learning complex movements. Like, again, I think we could probably get into a whole debate is like, is teaching someone how to power clean worth it? If your off season's like three months and you're going to you know, do that for this period of time. And it's like, you know, again, maybe it depends on training age. Maybe it depends on their factors and exposure to other things, but yeah, it's certainly something to, to think about for sure. Um, just again, I think that was really good advice hitting the fundamental patterns, you know, again, a lot of maybe split stance things for wrestlers again, where it's, it's still fundamental, but it's, it's common sense. If you look at like a watch a wrestling match, you can say, okay, they should probably do some sort of lunging pattern at some point. Right. So how can we load them effectively in a lunge pattern in a way that that makes sense for them and that they can actually load it effectively, like on day one, so they can actually start getting adaptations. Exactly. Okay. I guess two things. Number one, you mentioned the, the maximal strength thing, very important for um, just performance, like correlating really highly. Like if you're stronger, you're probably also going to be a little bit better on the mat. Um, and then the other side of that is obviously like things like muscular endurance are obviously going to be an important, have an important role in grappling sports because it's not like you're having a, uh, a maximal contraction and then you just get to walk off the mat unless you like pin the person. Right. Um, so how would you think about maybe developing those two ends of sort of the contraction spectrum? Yeah. So it would be based on how we lay out a, uh, I guess a season or a periodized like plan for that athlete. So let's say like six months out, right. We talked about that more off season training at that time. I'm likely doing a little higher volume, more like muscle endurance, strength, endurance characteristics on the mat. As we get closer and closer to that competition date, we're also getting more intense and lowering volume in what we're doing inside of the weight room. So that is where we get to develop more of those like max contraction, like uh, kind of explosive power, maximal strength characteristics. The benefit of that as well is we are with that max contraction, again, looking for like more neural adaptation. We're not doing like hypertrophy work. There's not going to be so much like mechanical tension and challenge that is going to leave them like with really sore biceps or like really sore lats. That's going to make it hard to train on the mat the next day. So it's split throughout that 
periodized season versus like trying to work on everything all at once, uh, especially knowing that as we get into intensification and pre-competition, they're really tired. Like their grips are blown out from all of the work that they've been doing on the mat. They don't want to do a bunch of like farmer's carries and grip intensive uh, work. They don't want to do a bunch of like core endurance work off the mat because their abs are exhausted from all of the inverting work that they were doing uh, in training. So again, leaving those characteristics for more accumulation off season and then getting more intense uh, and working on that more max contraction strength as we get uh, further and further uh, towards that competition date. I think maybe some people listening would think, well, isn't like a really strong contraction, like really draining. Um, but I think maybe it comes down to more so just like volume and like volumes often like the thing that really puts a, a dampening on, you know, how you feel a lot of the time, just like you're, if you have to adapt to a lot of work, it's a, you know expensive to, to recover from that. So there's the volume that you need when you're doing really intense work is just so much less. So exactly. I feel like that does maybe pair better going into the season. And then maybe even, you know, maybe if it's like, for example, like a wrestler where it's not just like one weekend and you're done, it's like a season to be able to kind of inter interlay that throughout the competitive season as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, as we get closer to competition, like let's say we're a month out from a competition date, at that point, we're not really trying to get them stronger. We're just trying to hold on. We're giving them like little doses and the amount of volume they need to hold on to those characteristics, but not with the goal of like actually getting stronger week by week by week. Again, depends on the person, right? If you have a novice client who's like, this is their first time that they've ever been exposed to training. Well, first of all, they're probably not hitting max contractions. We're probably just giving them like relatively higher volume, uh, more motor control to strength endurance characteristics throughout their season. Just knowing that they're not in the place, they don't have the support they need yet to be able to hit really heavy loads. So we'll keep that in mind. Volume and intensity are always relative to the individual. Um, but yeah, besides that, in those weeks leading up, we're, we're holding on. Uh, we're not really trying to improve strength anymore. Yeah, it's not about that at that point. Exactly. And I want to be careful as well. Like I, I mentioned that there are studies that show the correlation between maximal strength and then grappling performance. Uh, so we do know that like if we look at a pool of competitors, the stronger ones are, that's likely predictive of a good outcome. That doesn't mean that strength for the sake of strength is going to make you a better grappler or going to make you right. a better wrestler or BJJ athlete. So we have to think about like, what is the level of strength we need relative to the sport? And then second to that, do we have like the technical skills and the tactical skills we need uh, to actually go and use that strength in an effective way? Because if we don't have that, none of it's for shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely... You get that a lot with like someone who's like super strong, but then they have no skill and they like go to roll around and they end up, they're usually exhausted, like right away. Um, yes. um, but then also they're like, you know, a danger to themselves and everybody else on the mat. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's go to energy systems. Um, mm. So I think we kind of covered a lot of the strength training uh, or at least, you know, give somebody a good foundation of where to start. In terms of energy systems training, or we could maybe just call this conditioning. Um, again, if we take somebody, either one of these avatars, and we start them further away from competition, maybe what does that look like at that point? And then as we progress towards competition, how does it shift over time? So again, we know this is individualized to these people based on maybe if we do an assessment and see, you know, Jordan is really aerobically inclined. So we're going to give her maybe more intense work off the bat where James is someone who's more powerful. So maybe we give him more endurance work, for example, but how might a general outline go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to start by saying, I don't believe that energy systems work or conditioning work has to mirror or mimic just like strength work. I don't believe it has to simulate what's happening on the mat. So even though we know that James has seven minute matches as a wrestler and Jordan has four to five minute matches, and there's probably some differences in what's actually happening in those minutes, like wrestling is likely a little faster paced. Uh, whereas like at least gi jujitsu, there's a fair amount of like stopping, pausing in a position, holding a position. You don't get so much of that in wrestling. So 
preface this, I want to preface it by saying, I don't think that there has to be drastically different uh, implementation of energy systems training because their sports are a little bit different. Um, we want to think about more how are we improving this individual's aerobic capabilities. And so that isn't necessarily aligned with like them stepping out and doing five minute matches four times with 15 minute rest in between. So that's not what we're doing in conditioning. Right. But um, just broadly, like I guess, principally speaking for both of these folks, I would be focusing on aerobic energy system training primarily. What I mean by that is we're working intervals where we have, let's say we're going 10 minutes on, we're resting like five to 10 minutes, we're doing it again, and we want to ensure that the pace is sustainable. So if they're rowing for the 10 minutes, they're hitting the same number of minutes. If they're biking, they're hitting the same number of calories across all of their sets. So we're keeping that sustainable pace. Typically for a BJJ athlete, I'm having them live somewhere in like the three to 10 minute range for duration of intervals with like 0.5 to one work to rest ratio. So again, if they're doing three minute intervals, they're resting 90 seconds to three minutes and then going again. And again, the goal is not to necessarily make them better at their five minutes on the match. That is never the goal of the strength and conditioning coach. Like my job is not to make anyone better at BJJ through strength and conditioning. It is to better develop the physical characteristics that are important for BJJ so then they can go and do their sport. So I know if I make someone more aerobic, they're likely going to have a better opportunity to recover between matches. They're likely going to be able to sustain a higher level of power inside of their matches. And these are things that are going to be important for competitive success. So really long way of saying, again, I'm not trying to mimic the five minutes or the seven minutes in what I'm doing in energy systems training. We're six months away from uh, competition. Likely we're doing more supportive, longer, slower aerobic work. So it's possible we're hitting some like 30 to 60 minutes, just like steady state pieces when we're far off in the off season, if we've decided that person needs that. As we get closer to competition, again, similar to what I'm doing in resistance, I'm going lower volume and higher intensity, but ensuring that it is repeatable the entire time. So we might go from like 15 to 10 to five to three minute intervals, maintaining sustainable pace, but at an increasing pace as those intervals decrease. As we get into kind of intensification or even pre-competitive phases, so we're getting closer to that competition date, it's possible I use some incremental sets where I'm like, okay, I want you to get a little bit faster on set one, set two, set three, set four. You get a little bit of a hit of intensity for like the last one to two sets, but you're not doing a huge volume of highly intense work. Again, primarily keeping it aerobic to kind of flip the switch and talk about anaerobic energy system training. So like glycolytic work, stuff that is unsustainable and really tough and really high intensity. Let's say like, you know, 20 or 30 second assault bike sprint, rest a couple minutes, do it again. I'm not touching that. And this is maybe an unpopular opinion in, again, the grappling world. I do see a fair amount of people wanting to do HIIT training uh, with their grappler MMA athletes. I would highly encourage coaches and anyone who's in those sports to use your sport itself to get that intensity. I don't think there is any assault bike that can create the same level of like stress response, cortisol spike as you get from facing another human being and saying, I'm either going to choke them or try and break their arm or try and pin them, whatever it is. Like you can't get that stress response from an assault bike. So I don't believe that stress adaptation is a good reason to do anaerobic training in the weight room. Um, for sure, there is like blood lactate increases that happen when someone is in competition in BJJ. There's certainly a glycolytic element to it, but I don't think we need to do that with an assault bike or with a rower. So as someone gets closer to competition, as they're getting into intensification and pre-competitive phases, if you're not their sport coach, have a conversation with them and their sport coach and see if you can align their training week to be able to include some, whether it be simulation days or doing some like very short, like above maximal, like super maximal efforts of grappling where they're going like a minute or two minute on at a really hard pace, resting and do it again. Get them that like tough, brutal 
awful, painful exposure on the mat rather than trying to do that in your conditioning efforts is, is what I believe anyway. Yeah. It's probably a good way to do it is like, if you were the coach, who's the actual grappling coach, be like, okay, I want both athletes basically instruct them to be like, Hey, I need you moving the entire time and like actively trying to work in the position rather than just kind of like laying there and, you know, taking breaks, like as often you've seen in a lot of practice rooms. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so with the aerobic work, um, obviously you could give them just like, uh, you know, single modality erg, for example, like, okay, we're going to have you on the rower for 10 minutes. Okay. You rest and repeat basically doing that where you could do it on the assault bike or maybe the ski erg or something similar. Right. Um, is there in your mind, any place for mixed modal, like Metcon style conditioning for grappling athletes? Yeah, I think there can be. Again, it's just the right time and the right place. So one thing that comes to mind thinking about this is it's very easy to overload certain patterns for grapplers. Um, BJJ specifically, very grip intensive, a lot of pulling and a lot of bending that occurs. So like that pull and that bend pattern can very easily get overloaded if you decide to do a Metcon with a bunch of deadlifts, pull-ups and rowing. They're then going to have a blown out back grips, lats, and have a really hard time going into training the next day, or perhaps even run the risk of injury from overloading that pattern. So I want to think about like, what is my person going through on the mat and how could I be contributing to poorer recovery by giving them a ton of contractions that are similar to what they're doing on the mat? So first and foremost, if you're doing mixed modal work, uh, the person has to have a really robust aerobic system first. So they should have gone through like cyclical progressions for years prior to ever touching mixed modal work. And I believe that's the case, not just for grapplers and uh, wrestling athletes, but also the case for anyone that is wanting to perform mixed modal work. Make sure you've earned the right, learned your gears. We talk about the map progression at OPEX and in our education, but we want to see people progress through that with the lowest complexity, which is cyclical only, or like a bike or a rower only prior to adding in a bunch of other variables. Now, let's say someone has done that work. They have a great aerobic base. Our, you know, Jordan, our 16 year old female, she's been training aerobically for years and years and years. And she's at a place where she's also developed a great efficiency in all of her movement patterns and has earned the right to be able to put them in an aerobic setting. Am I doing mixed modal training with her? Maybe. Uh, if I am, it's probably further away from competition day where there's less stress on the mat. I'm contending with less variables and less like concern about the fact that she did standing guard break uh, 200 times yesterday. And I didn't realize this as her coach. So she literally did 200 partner deadlifts yesterday. And now I'm prescribing her 300 kettlebell swings in her workout. So I'm probably putting this uh, in an accumulation phase where I know that there's less intensity on the mat. I'm less worried about a competition date that I need to be fresh and ready for. Maybe we're doing it later in the season, but we're simplifying the modalities a little bit. So uh, instead of adding weightlifting in there, we're keeping gymnastics only movements. We're keeping it away from priority days. Like if I know she has a simulation day or like a competition class on a Saturday, I'm not giving her mixed modal work on a Friday. Maybe I'm giving it to her on a Sunday because then on Monday she's got a rest day. So I'm letting that come after. So it is not wrong to do it. We just have to know that we, especially if you're coaching grapplers and you're not a grappler yourself, sometimes you wake up the next day from a tough sparring day and you feel like you've been hit by a truck and you don't even know, like, you don't know what happened and who did it and like <laughs> what the cause was, but everything hurts. And it can be really tough to take that feeling and then be like, I have to go do a bunch of push-ups, pull-ups, um, power cleans and box jumps in a conditioning session it might be easier for that person to go and sit on the bike erg and do their conditioning work there, get their aerobic dose and not be limited by muscle endurance because of everything they did the day prior and not be just adding on top of that stress load by throwing a bunch of mixed contractions at them. So lots to consider there. Yeah, for sure. I think of all the, if I think of it just like, you know, athletics as a whole and people training for, you know, just say like high school athletics in the States. Um, I think of all the sports there. It's like, if I was 
you know, someone was like, Hey, Ben, can you train my kid? And you know, whatever sport it is like almost all sports. I'm going to be like, no, I'm not going to do mixed modal for them because that's not what they need. I think grappling is like the one, maybe not the only one, but certainly one of only maybe less than I can count on my hand of like sports where I'm like, I think at certain times of the season, if you are smart about how you do it and don't give them like competitive CrossFit type programming, like, okay, if you just give them mixed mode work in that sense, um, if you're someone who's experienced, you can do it like all these caveats. Like, I think there is a place where you can do it and it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, something I see is really beneficial for the person that has like their, let's just say they're not a white belt in uh, strength and conditioning, right? They're probably like a brown belt in strength and conditioning doing some, we call it aerobic, a lactic work. So we're doing, let's call it five minute intervals. Uh, we're going 15 cows on the assault bike. We're getting off that assault bike. And then we're hitting like a heavy power clean. And then we're getting on the assault bike again. And then we're doing at a sustainable pace, assault bike for 15 cows. Then we're jumping off and we're doing another heavy power clean. So in BJJ, that like CP pathway is quite important and it has to be activated and used under fatigue. Oftentimes like very decisive moments in a match that could cause uh, someone to get to a better position that's going to gain them points are through these explosive actions. So it could be a throw or a takedown. It could be a sweep where you have to shoot your hips into someone really quickly and take them up and over. And essentially the person who creates the most power the most quickly is going to be the one that does the best and everyone's tired and everyone's breathing at this point. So some aerobic, a lactic work where you're still doing sustainable aerobic work, but you're throwing in these like tougher, faster contractions uh, every now and then, you know, we're doing a row, we're hitting, you know, nice steady pace on the row, we jump off, we do two heavy front squats, then we get back on the row. Activities like that can be super beneficial uh, to teach that person what it's like to have to recruit power and to create that force under some level of metabolic fatigue. Right. So if I give an athlete, you know, say I got a wrestler in the off season, I'm like, okay, you know, every three minutes for five sets, you're going to do five back squats. Um, 75%. And in between each of those sets, you're going to ride the assault bike at an easy pace between it's like, is that technically mixed modal? Like, I guess, but it's just like training, like exactly. it's just like what they need. So I guess, I guess that's where we're coming from for this conversation. Like if you're a coach, you like understands what your athlete needs and your place is a strength condition coach. And you're not trying to do more than you need to. And like, end up beating them up for their season. Like there's probably a place for a lot of things that you could justify in the program. Absolutely. And have conversations, right? Again, there's a lot of unknown and a lot of variables that these grappling athletes face. And some person can adapt to a training program uh, better than other people. We all recover at different rates. We all can handle different levels of stress. Lifestyle is a factor I don't want to exclude for these folks because at least in like your MMA gyms, uh, traditionally that stuff doesn't get a lot of em emphasis. Like a lot of MMA athletes live shitty lifestyles. <laughs> like they're not sleeping, they're not eating well, they're not recovering. And so having those conversations is really important. Uh, but just keep in mind as you're talking to the person and getting their feedback, their subjective feedback, as well as looking what's happening with the numbers, because again, numbers don't lie. Uh, it's going to open your eyes to whether or not what you're giving them is appropriate. Uh, all right. Final question for you. So I think a lot of people just in general, when they're digesting content, it's really easy to feel like you're drinking out of like a fire hose <laughs> where it's just like, you need to like almost take time to like pause and like digest your information. One of the things I've heard you talking about is like taking time to like, quote unquote, like unplug. Um, and you're someone who's obviously, you know, working got like a lot on your plate there's like all this stuff where it's like go 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 and um you know i think taking time and plugs obviously important i think it's also really important for people to do after they've like digested some form of content or you know just taking the time to do that on a regular basis i think for people in our industry is super important so what does unplugging look like to you and then maybe where can people listening start as a way to like quote unquote unplug yeah. Oh, I like this question. Uh, unplugging for me, like on a consistent basis, I have 
I'm like a scheduling person, right? So my Google calendar is very blocked out with uh, the times that I work, the times that I train, the times that I prep for the day, uh, the times that I unplug, uh, that's all plugged into my Google calendar. So just make sure you have time for it set, because if you don't, you're not going to make it a priority. We're all busy. Like literally everyone is busy. The most like boring response to how are you doing is good, just busy. And I do it all the time, right? Like (laughs) when someone (laughs) asks me how I am, I say busy and then I catch myself It's just the worst thing to say because everyone is busy, but have time scheduled in your calendar Um, for me, Monday mornings uh, to start my week on the right foot. We go for a 60 minute walk before the sun's up with my husband along the canal, along the golf course by us. And it's a lovely start to the week on the right track. Secondarily, and this kind of connects with the um, digesting information piece and just like giving yourself an opportunity to sit with it. I journal every day, uh, specifically related to my BJJ training. So I train at nighttime. Uh, I, I do nighttime classes. And then the next morning, the first thing I do before I check my Instagram, check my emails, check my Slack is I take my iPad and I have like a little notes app that's all organized um, based on like different positions. And I write down the date and I put jot in some notes of what I'd learned the day before. And for, for me, that process is incredibly like number one, just relaxing. Number two, great opportunity to reinforce learning and make sure after sleeping on it, I still remember. And oftentimes I'll like pick up on details that I didn't even think about the day prior. So those would be the two big things for me. Um, Just getting outside, going for a walk, having that on your calendar, and then taking some time first thing in the morning every day to just reflect on the day prior. Good stuff. Georgia, thanks for doing this today. Oh, it was my pleasure, Ben. I could literally talk about uh, BJJ all day, (laughs) if you couldn't tell. So thank you for indulging me. Hey, it's Ben again. Thanks for listening today. To be completely honest, it's been really rewarding to have people who listen to the show regularly reach out to me, whether they have a question about training or just to say, hey. So if you haven't done that yet, do it. I'm pretty good about getting back to people and you can feel free to email me, ben at sorefitness.com or message me on Instagram at sorefitness. And graciously, I've had some people reach out to me and ask how they can support the show. Number one way that you can support the show if you are a regular listener is just by rating the show. Most apps have a platform where you can actually rate it and on Apple Podcasts, you can write a review as well. This is super helpful in having other coaches and athletes find the podcast, but also just having it grow and for me to continue to want to put out more and more content. Also, I'm going to be posting more full episodes of the Fitness Movement to our YouTube channel. So if you're someone who actually enjoys seeing my face when I talk, you can head over to YouTube and subscribe if you please. And if you're someone who is watching on YouTube, you have the ability to like our videos, but then you can also comment on the video if you have questions about the episode or if you want to suggest a topic for a future episode. And lastly, if you're someone who really does value what we're putting out, I would encourage you to hire a coach. For me, coaching is the bulk of my job and it's what I believe I do best. So if you're an athlete or a coach looking to up your fitness game, be sure to reach out. You can message me on Instagram at Zor Fitness or email me ben at ZorFitness.com. Thanks again for listening today. And as always, stay the course.